it looks like we're pretty tight in here. So if you have a free seat next to you, please make it easy for people to find it. Maybe stand up and wave your arms. Um, we can offer it to them kindly by handing it to you. I don't know. So thank you all for being here. My name is Daniel Sellers. I'm a front end engineer at Instructure. If you're looking for a job right now in the valley, you should think about Instructure. It's a great place to work. Um, and come talk to me afterwards. So, by way of introduction, um, I moved to Utah about three and a half years ago, um, and I've been doing development for a very long time, since the first dot-com bubble, when I probably should have known that I could have made a lot of money, but instead didn't know, and so I just kept writing little tiny dinky websites in my house in Austin, and did not cash in on that bubble. So, had that happened, I might not be here, I might be living in the Bahamas somewhere, which would be kind of cool. But luckily for both of us, that didn't happen. So, today we're going to talk about this lovely thing, the array. Um, so arrays are basically everything in JavaScript. You can argue that with me later, but they're probably the most important thing for you to understand um, as far as the, the base uh, object types go, because they're really, really flexible and you can do an amazing array of things with them. Um, the first part of this presentation, we're gonna be drinking from the crazy fire hose because I wanted to give you a sampling of just about everything that there is to be done with arrays. And then at the end, we're gonna have fun. So, um, if you have access to the internet, which in this room you may not have, because I didn't, go to this website and we'll play with it later. I'm gonna leave that for like three seconds, two seconds, one second. If you can't really see it, it's arrays.ansble.com. You can play with it later. Um, it's got a bunch of stub data in the, on the window element and a bunch of functions that you can use to play with arrays on the window. So, Let's get down to it. So I like to try and figure out what a real world um, analogy for everything in programming is. Um, you can ask anyone who I've talked to about events with. Like, I like real world analogies. They help me understand what I'm doing better. And over the last while, I've been trying to come up with a good analogy for arrays. Because, you know, what is an array? What is this crazy abstract thing that we call an array? So an array is like a train. It has many different types of content in JavaScript. You are not stuck with a single type in an array unless you're using a typed array. So you can have, you know, tank cars or objects, box cars, flatbed cars, these coal cars, passenger cars. There's lots of different types of cars that can make up any one given train. Um, you know, a, a, any given train can carry. Um, coal and natural gas and automobiles and rocket parts and airplanes and airplane parts and nuclear waste. You can shove all those on the same train. That's pretty awesome. Which is much like an array in JavaScript where you can shove any type of data inside of this one container and deal with it later on. Um, and on the array, uh, there are three categories of functions built into the array object in JavaScript. You've got mutators, Accessors, sorry, that's a little bit hard to read. Um, and iterators. So we're going to run through those super quickly. <coughs> Mutators, as you probably would guess, mutate the array. So when you use these functions, which happen to be these functions, you're actually changing the array that you started with. Um, so pop, push, reverse, shift, sort, splice, unshift, copy within, and fill. Um, all of those actually change the contents of your array that you started with. That can be a good thing, that can be a bad thing, but it's something to be aware of. Because if you don't realize that pop is actually going to take the last element off the array and give it to you and take it out of the array, then you can have some really weird stuff happen. Um, so as far as breaking these into category, pop and shift are basically the exact same function except one deals with the front of the array and one deals with the back. So shift pulls off the front of the array, 
returns the first element and rewrites the array as 2, 3, 4, 5. Pop does the same thing for the back. Um, push adds things to the back of the array. Unshift adds them to the front of the array. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Sweet. Reverse. What does reverse do? Any guesses? <laughs> it's like the best named function in the entire array API. Yeah. It reverses the array. Like it just reorders it. So your 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 becomes 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Splice takes things out of the array. So um, the signature for splice is the index that you want to start at and how many things you want to cut, right? Cut out of the array, and that becomes your array. So start at index 1, which is 2, take three out, so two, three, four becomes our new array. We've cut off the ends, basically. Um, that's what splice does. Sort, so sort bears a little bit more discussion because sort can be really, really simple and give you an uh, ordered array um, and ascending value, which is great. It's super easy if you need to order things alphabetically or numerically. Just run it through sort plain and you'll get it back. You can run reverse on that and it flips it around and gives you descending instead of ascending. So, but you can also pass a function to sort. So you can write your own custom sort functions, which is pretty powerful. Um, and for a sort function to work, basically, it take, passes you A and B, which is the item in the array and the next item in the array, and then it compares them. If you're zero, then it leaves it alone. If you're Greater than one, it shifts that this way, and if you're less than one, it shifts it the other way. Um, really, really cool, really, really useful. Well, there's something important about sort, and that is you really have to think functionally with sort. You cannot get state involved in sort. Um, getting state involved in sort is A, a very bad idea, and B, it will actually cause your sort order to be undefined according to the MDN. <coughs> So compare functions must always return the same value when given a specific pair of elements. So you don't want to mix state into that or anything that is mutable outside that function. You need to think very, very functionally pure. Um, and this is the beauty of arrays. Arrays allow you to be very, very pure in your functions. Um, if you do them right, you don't have to mess with a lot of outside stuff or anything that you need from the outside can be passed in as a parameter to that array which would allow this to be true, right? So if you passed in whatever state you wanted to your compare function, um, then it could still work. Because for that given state, plus the A and B, you'd get back the same thing. We'll see more of that later, I promise. That may sound confusing, but it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, so these are two that are still sort of unstable. Um, they are both in Chrome at this point. Um, and in Firefox, so they'll probably be stabilizing soon. They're part of the ES6 spec. Um, fill and copy within. Fill is really cool because it will fill an array. That sounds a lot dumber than it actually is. Uh, but what it lets you do is do something like this. So if I take an array and I set its length to 10, I haven't actually, like I've sort of faked out JavaScript. Length is a immutable, um, parameter on the array object. That means you can go in there and say array.length equals infinity and blow everything up. Um, but you don't actually have any values in there. You have an empty array full of undefined. And when we get to the iterators, if you use the iterators on an array that you've done this to, it doesn't do anything. It never iterates because um, it actually isn't looking at length for iteration. Use a for loop, you would go ahead and iterate to 10. Uh, but using one of the built-in iterators, it doesn't. So if you actually want to fill, create an array with 10 slots really, really quickly, you can do something like this. An array.fill will actually put 10 instances of the number one in there. So you have an array of 10 ones after you do this. Does fill accept a callback? It does not. It's not. Yeah. Um, but it is executed synchronously. So. It's done right then. Um, and then copy within lets you take a piece of an array and copy it to another portion of an array. Um, so it's sort of like slicing and then overwriting 
the original array with your slug. That sounds like a terrible example. But you can see right here, one, two, three, four, five, we start at index zero, and we start our copy starting at index three, which is four, and then we copy to the end, so we get four, five, three, four, five. We overwrite the one and two. Um, this is one of the more confusing uh, signatures, I think, in the array. It, it's not great. It's weird. It's just like slice and splice later on are both kind of weird in their dealing with indexes. Okay, so accessors. So those were the things that changed the array. So if you do copy within, your original array, the one that you started out with, has been modified. Um, you cannot get it back to the state it was previously in because you have overwritten that state. Same thing with fill and all the other ones we've talked to up until now. <coughs> Accessors do the opposite. Accessors don't overwrite your array or its values. Um, all that they do is return things to you. So they leave your original array completely alone. So these are things like concat, uh, index of, includes, which is coming. And they look like this. So if you do array.join on an array of 1, 2, 3, 4, it returns to you the string 1 pipe, 2 pipe, 3 pipe, 4. Um, which sounds like a Dr. Seuss story. <laughs> so, but it actually doesn't modify the array. So if I had assigned that array previously to a variable and I ran dot join on it, I could still access that array. So I could actually join that array again um, on a different line with a different joiner and it, I would get an, the same result because that array hasn't been changed. Um, if I want to hold on to the thing that I joined, the result of my join, I need to assign that to a variable or pass it to a function or do something um, immediately. To string, which is like join, but doesn't accept any parameters and always uses commas to join things. So it's like the default join. If you don't pass a, a delimiter to join, it uses commas as well. So it's basically default join forever. Um, to, to locale string is kind of cool. You can take an array of all sorts of different data types and pass it to to locale, to locale, that is hard to say, to locale string, and it will look at the locale of your browser, and anything in there that has a locale format, so for instance a date, will get formatted to match the locale that your browser is set to. Um, so for instance, this is, uh, the date is formatted in the default locale format for the locale for Salt Lake City, Utah, basically, as I because I ran that last night to get that value. So um, that's really useful if you want to have a whole bunch of stuff in an array and one part of it happens to be uh, a date or a currency that needs to be formatted appropriately for the end user. Um, this would handle that for you, which is really nice. Um, so then there's these. These three gentlemen, index of, last index of, and includes. Includes is coming in ES7. Um, basically, it just checks to see if the array includes the value. Um, index of returns to you the index of that value. So, for instance, if we say index of 1, it's going to return the first index that it finds it at, which is 0 in this array. Last index of is going to return the last index that it finds it at, which is going to be 4 in this array. Um, and then if we look for something with index of that isn't in the array, we get back negative 1. So you, if you're checking for whether or not it's there, if you're using index of as it includes at this point, you're comparing against negative 1. Okay. Concat and slice. So concat takes all sorts of things and concats them into a single array and returns the result. Um, which is very, very useful. So if we pass concat an array, a few numbers, and another array, we get back an array of all of those things that's relatively flat. Um, if you pass it an array of an array, it's messy and you need to flatten that out. Um, or if you pass it objects that contain arrays, you have to do some fun stuff there. But concat lets you join all sorts of arrays together to form a single array, which is very nice. Um, Again, these don't modify the original arrays, so you get back the results. If you don't do anything with the result, it goes away. Um, and the original arrays stay exactly how they are. 
slice returns um, elements from within an array. So syntax is start index, <coughs> end index. So one gets you two and three, or sorry, start at one, stop at two, so that gives you two. That makes sense. The, the APIs that deal with indexes are kind of silly in JavaScript. They're not great. So that's all of our accessors. As you can tell, like arrays have a ton of functions built into them. Um, because really you can use them for just about any type of data that you're dealing with. Um, and these, all of these uh, accessors and mutators are really, really useful for manipulating your data on the fly and keeping your code nice and, and functional and side effect free. So the last and probably the coolest part that we're going to run through real quick and then we'll play is the iterators. Um, how many of you still use for loops to iterate through your arrays? Don't be embarrassed. You can raise your hand. Okay. Guess what? They're probably still faster. But they're probably not as expressive. So, uh, thanks to ES6, we have a whole bunch of new iterators. Some of these are actually older than ES6. Most of these are available in browsers right now. Um, in fact, all of these except for values works in Chrome, not Edge, like not Chrome Canary, normal Chrome right now today. Um, and most of these, I think including values, work in Firefox today. So depending on what your support bracket is, you could go out and use these right now. So, so I, I noticed that you keep not saying that it's supported in like Internet Explorer or Edge or. So Edge, because of its uh, its ES6 support, should have most of these. I don't know specifically which of the unstables are supported in Edge. Anything that's in stable is supported pretty much cross browser. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I didn't make that clear earlier. If it's in unstable, that means the support is sort of questionable and it's still in flux to a certain extent. The stuff up top is pretty much nailed down in the language in the browsers. Um, so, and if you're a Node person, most of the bottom stuff, because Node is now on the same V8 as Chrome, um, same version of V8 as Chrome essentially, most of the bottom stuff exists there right now as well, um, which is really great. So, every Every is a cool little iterator. It iterates over the entire array, um, executing the function, passing the, uh, the item, the index, and the array. So you can put up to three parameters on your function. Normally, you're just going to need one, which is the actual value that you're looking at. And it checks to see if the return is true for all of them. So if they're all greater than 0, then it returns true. If any one of them is not greater than two, then it returns false. So it requires that every value in the, the array pass uh, whatever the test is in the function. Sum does basically the same thing, except it's more lenient. Um, it says, if some of them meet this test, then it's true. If none of them meet this test, then it's false. So some of them are greater than two, so it would return true. None of them are greater than zero, or none of them are less than zero, so it would return false. The sum shortcut, or does it run through all of them? It runs through all of them. So all of them run through all of them except for find, which we will get to. Um, so all of the iterators will execute for every value in the array, except for find, which is in labs. Um, find goes until it finds the first one, and then it exits, which is super useful, um, especially if you're doing things where you only need the first value and you don't need multiple values. Um, so filter, for instance, runs for every single item, and it checks to see which ones pass the filter function, so a number greater than one, and it returns an array made up of the values that pass. Um, very useful. Something else to bear in mind is all these examples are using simple values. They're using immutables in JavaScript. So your base, uh, booleans, numbers, strings are immutable. Um, they get overwritten. If you're using something complex like another array or an object, 
Those are going to be passed by reference in this case. So you'll get back an array of objects, and if you change those objects, you're changing them in the parent array, if that's where they were declared. Right? So um, you need to, if you need to cut that tie, you're going to need to run a clone, essentially, and copy those out so that it's not the same object. Just something to be aware of. Generally, you're not modifying the original array, except in the case where you're passing a complex value that's passed by reference. In that case, you will be modifying the values in the parent array. Um, so find and find index, find returns uh, your, the find returns the value when it finds something that passes the test, the first value. So greater than two, it would hit one, two, three, return three, and never execute for four, one, two, one, two. Um, so that cut it down its, its life cycle pretty substantially. Um, find index does the same thing, but it returns the index of the item. Um, that's probably, this is a slightly confusing example because I'm using numbers here, and it returns a number, but what it does is it returns the index, which for three is two, because uh, JavaScript is zero index. Is that all? Does everything make sense so far? I know we're moving fast. Okay. If it doesn't make sense, it will soon. Uh, map and reduce. So map and reduce, if you're using a for each, you might want to reconsider and consider whether or not a map or a reduce is a better choice. Um, just like if you're using a for loop, you might want to consider whether or not these iterators are a better choice. In part because messing with the length of an array messes with your for loop, messing with the length of an array doesn't mess with these. Um, so map returns the result of the array after having been modified by the map function. This is a really simple one. All it does is multiply the number by two. Um, so you pass it in one two three four one two one two. You get back two four six eight two four two four. Um, it's a new array. All those values have been modified in whatever way the the map function dictates. Um, and then this guy, which is reduce and reduce right. Um, so reduce returns whatever you would like it to reduce of whatever size you would like it to reduce. So reduce can return an object. It could return um, an array. You could essentially implement map and reduce. Um, so what this does, basically we've implemented join uh, with no delimiter in the reduce function here. So we take the previous element, we pass, we add the current element to it and then we return that, and that becomes the previous element on the next iteration through. So previous in a reduce function is whatever was returned by the last execution of that function. Um, so it's an accumulator. So you get A, B, C, D, just slammed against each other, string can cut it up. Um, if you do reduce right, reduce right does the exact same thing, but it executes from the end of the array instead of from the front of the array. Um, so it's like doing a negative index in your for loop, as opposed to an additive index in your for loop. So same thing, only you get DCBA. So that's uh, supposed to be a plus sign? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes, that's a plus sign. You can't divide letters. That would be crazy. <laughs> Actually, you can divide these letters because they are valid hex, so you would get a number. That would be trippy. Um, so, one, two, so, uh, yes, make sure that you don't copy and paste the wrong code when you're writing presentations. <laughs> um, so, this is a little bit more interesting example in that it returns the result of a mathematical operation. So, basically, it divides all the numbers by the previous. The previous number is divided by the current number. So, one gets divided by two which would be 0.5, which then gets divided by 3, which then gets divided by 4, and you end up with 0 0.01041. <coughs> you really can't trust that number at that point. Um, can you tell us what previous is on your very first iteration? Yes. 
So you can either pass previous a value in the reduce. So after the function, you can pass it an object or an array or whatever you want it to end up as, as your initial value. Or it is actually the first position in the array if you pass nothing. So it actually begins execution with, because I'm not passing it anything, it actually begins execution with cred equals one and cur equals two. Um, so it jumps to second position and passes the first item as your initial value if you don't pass it anything which can be super useful. It also can totally blow things up if you're not expecting that. Um, reduce right, same thing, but the opposite direction. So your first two would be two and one. So prep would be two, one would be her at that point. <clears throat> this is for each, which you can basically replace all of your for loops right now today with this and have more expressive code. Um, for each is fine. It's not great. For each encourages side effects because it doesn't return anything. So anything that you're doing inside your for each is essentially a side effect. If you're familiar with the idea of side effects in functional code, um, you have to reach outside of your function to do something with for each because it doesn't return anything. Um, it's really useful for things where you have to have side effects, like the DOM, which is a mess and side effect uh, This is a really simple for each. It just logs out each one as it runs through it. Um, but like we talked about earlier with iterators, if iterators don't actually look at array.link, um, they ignore it completely, and they look at the internals of the array and deal with the array keys um, in the language at a much lower level, which means that uh, unless you have filled your function that you created to a length of infinity, which, why did you do that? You're trying to crash browsers or something? Um, for each will not even execute. It would just go, oh cool, here's an array that has nothing in it, and walk on. Um, it has to have actual values in the slots. Those values can actually be undefined. So if you, you know, do an array literal, and put four undefines in there, this would run four times. Um, but you can't just push out your length and then expect your iterators to pick that up. So that's the one way that for each is very different than an actual for loop, um, where if you're looking at length, you're going to get all those iterations. Do you have time for questions now, or do you want to hold on? No, I Let's hold yet. to right at the end. Um, these are. The three big iterators that are in ES6 coming. Um, there's also custom iterators that I don't think we have time to go into. Um, but they're really interesting. Uh, what you get back is an iterator or an iterable. I don't know if that's actually what they call it. We'll just call it an iterator. Um, so if I do dot keys on this, I get back an object that has a next function. Um, and I call iter.next and it returns value zero, which is the key, so zero. And then whether or not the iteration is done. And each time I call iter.next, it's going to go through the keys um, in the array until I get to done through. On another note, values does basically the same thing, but it returns the value instead of the array index. So basically keys returns your index, values returns the value in the position in the array. Um, same signature, you get the same results. The one that's slightly different is entries where it returns to you the key and the value in an array. So you get value zero is array index zero and the value of array index zero is A. Um, so these are iterables, iterators. I'm making up words up here. Uh, that's once you stand up here, you can make up words apparently. Um, and they're they are here. They're, the exception is values does not actually work in Chrome right now. Uh, the other two do, um, so you can get this and play with it. <coughs> so where are we at on time? Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes. Sweet. Playtime. So, if you were able to pull this up earlier, then you can play along. And if you weren't able to pull this up earlier, you can play along with it later. So, 
Uh, this page basically does a couple of things and only a couple of things. It has a link to the slides, um, but it also has a whole bunch of stub data. And since we're talking about how Razor trains, it creates on load an array of a thousand random trains. Um, each tray, each tray, each train has some properties. It has an array of cars, um, and it has a destination, and a starting location, and a train ID. So your cars look like that. This is oddly a tank car with rocket parts. <laughs> Whoever loaded this train wasn't very smart. Um, they probably shouldn't let him speak at conferences. <laughs> so what, we, what we're going to do is play with some of these functions um, to filter things out. So let's say we are here in Salt Lake. So let's find all of our trains. Um, that are, are making a short trip. So a short trip, short trip is this lovely function right here. It's very, very simple. It checks to see if the item, if the train's start location and destination are the same. Because that's a really short trip. Um, <laughs> maybe it's making a giant loop and coming back, but that's a very short tri trip for a train. Probably not very efficient routing going on. So we're going to look for short trips, and then we're going to look for um, trains that are carrying. So this is the carrying function, which is another filter function. It's really simple. Um, all it does is it. It iterates, uh, it's not very visible. It iterates over all the cars in a train to see if that train is carrying that cargo. So it looks like this. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to find all of the trains carrying nuclear waste that are making short trips to Salt Lake City and then determine whether or not we should all abandon this place. Um, Okay, so carrying takes one parameter. Um, it's a higher level function, so basically what it does is it takes uh, a type of cargo that you want to see, um, puts that type of cargo in a closure, and returns the function that will actually be used by a filter. So it returns the actual filter function. Um, higher level functions like this are super useful for manipulating large areas of data, and they can make it very, very expressive. So trains carrying nuclear waste, short trip, taking a short trip to Okay, so this will give us all the trains that are carrying nuclear waste going on one of those weird short trips to Salt Lake City, Utah. Oh no, that's not good. Guys, there's Let's see, how many are there? Length, there's eight. Eight trains that are carrying nuclear waste that are leaving Salt Lake City and coming back to Salt Lake City right now. This is all made up there. You don't need to go to your bomb shelters. <laughs> it's okay. Hazmat suits may or may not be provided to you after this. Um, so we can do other things, like if we wanted to get the IDs of all of those, we can run it through a reduce function. Which I happen to have a reduce function that pulls out the ID um, for them. So now, whoops. Okay, sorry. Forgot to pass it an array. That's that first parameter. I wound up with an object. I blew things up. I have one minute. So here are the IDs. We can now like grab those trains and maybe call their director conductor and be like, hey, maybe you should unload that nuclear waste in Nevada and not in Salt Lake. Um, so this is, this is the beauty of these map and reduce functions um, and with dealing with arrays of your data. Um, you have a really, really expressive API. I showed this to my wife last night. I'm like, okay, honey, tell me approximately what this code is doing. My wife is a preschool teacher. 
And she was able to pretty much tell me that I was looking for trains that carry nuclear waste, that are headed to Salt Lake, and that I was grabbing the IDs for them. Um, so one of the, the great things about using arrays for as much of your data needs and as many of your APIs as possible is that it allows for this kind of expressive code um, where a normal person can look at it and go, oh, I can basically tell what this is doing. And that's really important because while you may know what your code is doing, the person who's going to come in after you leave your job and come work at Instructure with me, um, they may not. And you really want them to have a nice time with your code because otherwise they're going to hate you. And we're really not that big of a community that you can have people who hate you in. So thank you all for coming. If you have questions, come up and talk to me afterwards.